right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Statistics Without Borders annual meeting. Uh, I'm excited for us to get started. Uh, people are filing in, so we're going to give people a couple of moments before we kick off with anything. So if you need to run and grab a drink or if you need to do anything, um, run to the restroom, something like that beforehand, we'll get started at about three minutes after the hour with introductions. So um, you've got a couple of minutes if you want to run and refill your coffee mug or stretch your legs or something like that. Uh, we'll get started here in a moment. All right, welcome to everyone. Um, we're going to get started here in a moment. We're going to give folks a, a couple of minutes to trickle in. So if you want to grab a drink or something like that, stretch your legs, feel free to do that. We'll get started here in about a minute or so. All right, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, everybody. I'm excited to be chatting with you all today. Uh, my name is Matt Brems. I'm a volunteer here with Statistics Without Borders and welcome to our annual meeting. We're excited to, uh, to kick off today. So really quickly, before getting started, a couple of housekeeping things. The first thing that I wanna do is just thank General Assembly. Um, General Assembly has graciously provided us use of their webinar platform. Uh, so feel free to check them out. They're an organization that does a lot of uh, teaching and education around data, tech, like web development and software development, design, uh, marketing, all of those things. So feel free to consider checking them out. I've got their website linked right there toward the bottom of the screen at generalassemb.ly want to take a look. Um, but we're very grateful that they were able to let us use their Zoom platform for our annual meeting today. In addition to that, wanted to share that uh, we'd encourage you to engage with us. So feel free to follow us on Twitter. Uh, you can find us at at SWB Pro Bono. Uh, feel free to follow us on Twitter and engage with us today as well as beyond today. In addition, if you want to check out our website, you can head to statisticswithoutborders.org. Those are going to be at the bottom of the screen the entire time. And then finally, what we'd like for you to do is if you've got any questions at any point throughout today, there's the Q&A button. Feel free to click that. It might be at the top of your screen. So if you mouse up to the top of your screen or maybe it's on the bottom, there should be a Q&A box. We're gonna do our best to address questions and answers as they arise. We've got a lot of time set aside at the end for questions and answers, but as long as we stay ahead of schedule, we'll be sure to uh, try and answer questions as we can as they arise throughout the talk. Uh, and the last thing to mention here is that this is being recorded. So we're going to share this on YouTube at the end of our session today. With all of that said, let's go ahead and get started. I would love to turn it over to Jean Opsimer, our chair of SWB. Hey, thank you, Matt. So um, this is just a, a brief outline of what we will be doing today during our annual meeting. I'll, I'll speak a little bit about um, our organization, um, very briefly just describing um, who we are, what we do, and then I'll introduce the, the members of our um, executive team and some of the other leadership. Um, and then other people are gonna go through the, the other items, but uh, talk a little bit about the last year, what we did, and then um, 
what I think is the, the most exciting part of the program, which is um, having some of the people who did several projects last year describe those, those projects. Um, and then the last part would be talking about our plans for the, the next year. So let me go through that. So I, oh, I can't advance the slide. Matt, can you advance the slide? Yes, thank you. So uh, Statistical Without Borders um, was started in, in 2008 by um, Steve Pearson, Gary Shapiro, Jim Cochran, and Fritz Sheeran. And um, at least the first two are in, in this meeting. Um, so you, you'll see their, their pictures too later on. And so then what I listed here is the, the mission of our organization. And it, it's, it's a bit of a mouthful, but um, so I'm, I won't read the whole thing, but what we do is we provide pro bono services in statistics and data science to organizations who typically um, could not afford to, to use those, those services. And as we do that, we try to um, you know, just enhance um, the ability of those organizations to use statistics and to do decision-making. Um, another aspect of this is we think of ourselves as um, a humanitarian statistical organization. And the, um, the other aspect of our organization is we're, we're not an independent organization. We're actually an outreach group of the um, American Statistical Association. Um, but that said, you don't have to be a member of, of uh, ASA to join SWB. It's just that they are the ones that are um, helping us um, both financially and pro providing some of the support so that we can uh, perform this mission that's just written right above there. So, okay, Matt, can you go to the next slide? So I said I was gonna introduce some of the people who are in the leadership of SWB. And so this is our um, executive committee. And um, the first four people are actually elected positions in our organization. So we have um, the past chair, Kathy Furlong, and then we have the vice chair, um, Davina Durgana. Then there's myself um, in the middle there. Um, and then the last elected position is our secretary, and that's uh, Jay Brodsky. And then as an um, honorary member of our executive committee, we have Gary Shapiro, who's one of the founders. Um, and then we have um, the next three positions are basically the people who are in charge of our directorates, which is where most of the, not most, all of the day-to-day -day work of um, Statistics with a Board takes place. So David Whitford is the engagement director. Uh, Matt Brems, that you just heard, is the Markham director, and then Smita Skrivanik is the operations director. And I'll describe those three pieces very briefly uh, a little bit later on. And then Steve Pearson is our ASA liaison and is also one of the co-founders. So Matt, can you go to the next one? So I mentioned those three uh, directorates, so they're, they're listed here. And um, I'll, I'll take them in, in reverse order. So the engagement director is where the the projects happen. Oh, don't go to the next slide yet, Matt. I just want to talk here and then we'll go through the people. Thank you. So that, that's where, um, you know, all the heavy lifting is and all the projects are in the engagement director. And then the other two directorates are, are there to support engagement to that extent. We have the ops or operations directorate that runs our infrastructure. Um, and then marketing and communication is our um, both inward and outward looking directorate that, um, you know, communicates what, what we're doing. Um, so, okay, so Matt, now go ahead, please. Okay, so engagement, um, the people who are listed here are the ones in charge of the main committees within that, but you see that number there too, approximately 150 people. There's a lot of people who are also having positions within those various committees. And so um, the I'll just talk about the, the four, committees briefly. So one of the committees is new client acquisition. This is where projects come in. And the people who are leading that committee are uh, Kathy Furlong and Gary Shapiro. And there's an additional 25 people who are, who are working within that committee. Then the next one is um, project and client management. We often refer to it as PCM. And there the people who are in charge are uh, Fatima Zerin and Lina Lichtig, and I'm, I'm sorry if I don't say your last name correctly. And there's another 40 volunteers there who are um, PCM um, leaders who are basically running the projects. 
So the next one is statistical consultants, and that's Janet Reboud and Christine Wells. And they are providing the uh, statistical expertise or data science expertise to the, the projects that are being run by the, the PCMs. And there's another 30 volunteers there. And then the last one is the delivery and quality assurance DQA um, led by Michiko Wokat and Ed Gracely with another 50 volunteers there. Um, and they are the ones who make sure that the projects are um, achieving their purposes, staying on time, doing everything that they're supposed to do, and basically making sure that um, they follow best practices. So next slide. Um, so the next committee is ops or operations, and there's five volunteers there. There's the uh, director and associate director. So that's Smita Skrivanik and Shannon Lacer cortez And uh, there's three more positions within that to run some of the subsets. And these are currently open. So um, we'll talk about that very briefly at the end. Um, next one. And then the last one is Marcom. Um, and um, the person who, who's in charge in acting capacity currently, but that's gonna be changed shortly as a Sloka Yengar. Um, we have a website coordinator, that's and job, um, multimedia coordinator, Michelle Vanchu Orozco. Um, and then um, other people who are newer on the committee um, for internal communications coordinator, Wasila Kwader, uh, external communications coordinator, Simran, Bahia, and then finally a networking communicator, Anna Kuprina. So um, those are all the people that I wanted to highlight, but like we saw in the previous slide, there's a whole bunch of other people who are also working in leadership positions within those committees. So Matt, can you go to the next slide? Okay, so now I'm gonna hand it over to um, Shannon um, for the next part. So um, Shannon, go ahead. I think you're muted, Shannon. So. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, SWB has over 1,700 volunteers all around the world. And that is in part due to an increase of over 14% just over the last year. Um, so what we would like for you to do now as participants is if you haven't done so already, go to the chat and share your name and location. Matt, you can go to the next slide. Okay, well, I'm David Whitford and um, I'm gonna try to answer the question, what did SWB do last year? We're glad to say that we had 32 projects that we worked on during the year versus about 20 from last year. So we've increased by 50% and very happy with that. Breaking these down by their, what did we do in these projects? We had 13 that I've called analyses of survey data or database data. Sometimes we do an entire survey and its analysis. Sometimes people come to us with survey results that they need analyzed. Um, for the most part, the database data analyses are uh, data science products. And we have people on board that, um, that do a very fine job in data science techniques. We also had nine visualizations. And with the on onset of the COVID pandemic, uh, this became very popular this year. Um, we produced quite a few data uh, visualizations. We presented our, came up with models and presented them. And we did some uh, mega studies, which put together multiple studies and presented the rest of those. We had six um, projects that were, I'd call statistical methodology projects. Basically, these were consulting projects. Um, one example was that we did work for some South American countries 
that had, when COVID hit, they had half finished a, a survey, say a monthly survey, and needed some help in figuring out how to incorporate that into their series for, the, for that uh, monthly survey. And we had three teaching projects, um, one of which is going on now that's um, in Rwanda. We're teaching uh, statisticians, um, holding some classes for statisticians in Rwanda. And we had one genetics project, which you will hear ab about uh, later. So one of the things that I'd like to get into at this point is looking at some of the other things that we did within SWB. So I've spent the last couple of years focusing on our marketing and our communications work. So a couple of things that I want to call out that go beyond the projects that we do um, and, and taking a, a very brief step back, we do projects around the world, uh, as you've likely picked up on or as you're likely familiar with, with Stats Without Borders. And in addition to that, there's a lot of stuff that we do as like permanent volunteers that help keep things running on a day-to-day -day basis and, and making sure that we can talk a lot about the projects that we do. Um, so within marketing and communications, we recently wrapped up edit, guest editing Chance Magazine uh, and had four articles submitted and accepted on behalf of Statistics Without Borders that will be published in the September issue of Chance Magazine. We've dramatically improved the or increased the number of volunteers we have in marketing and communications. So we went from three to six, which is going to allow us to do a lot more when it comes to maintaining social media and refreshing the website and publishing case studies. Uh, we have developed and are in the process of publishing seven volunteer recruitment videos. So I see a lot of questions that come up around um, that, that people are asking, like, as someone who recently graduated with a degree, what's the, what are the odds that I would be selected for a project or something like that? So we are in the process of posting these on our YouTube page and on our website about what are all the different ways you can get involved with projects and other volunteer opportunities within SWB. Like if you wanted to be on marketing and communications, or if you wanted to be uh, part of the operations or the project and client management team. And the last thing we've done within Marcom is developing partnerships with organizations like Datakind and the American Association for the Advancement of Science, which allows us to bring more projects in. If there's a project that's not a great fit for us, we can offload that project or share that project with other organizations. We can gain valuable expertise from them. So these are some of the things that we've been focusing on from marketing and communication last year. With that, I'm going to toss it over to Jay Brodsky to talk about what we've done in terms of volunteer management. Hi, I hope you guys can all hear me. I'm Jay Brodsky. I am the secretary of SWB. If you were wondering what the secretary does, the answer is the official position does very little except take notes at meetings. So what we've done is we're using this position to tackle um, administrative and organizational uh, issues in the background. Um, so I've been working on a couple of things, and one of the big ones I've been working on is what we're calling volunteer management. We have over 1,700 volunteers. We started with, I think, eight way back in the beginning. So we need um, a better volunteer management system. So I'm designing one that will handle recruitment, onboarding, communications, conflict resolution amongst volunteers, and also in case we have conflicts with any clients. Um, there are some other um, volunteer topics that aren't really within the scope of SWB, but people have been asking us about them and we can certainly facilitate some things. Networking and mentoring are the two big ones that people are very interested in. Um, so if you have, if you're a new volunteer, the biggest question we get from new volunteers are things like, how likely am I to get selected for a project? What type of background do I need? Um, what should I sign up for, et cetera? So we, I'm working on building a system that answers these questions when you uh, join SWB and will facilitate communication uh, between volunteers. Um, and I'm going to keep it very short and we will move on to the next topic, but you will probably get emails from us about this later in the year. For a second, I'd like to talk about how COVID affected our projects. 
ENSWB. We had 12 projects out of the 32 projects that we worked on that pertain to COVID in some way. Um, I have three examples up here. We had some data gathering and visualization projects, including three studies on establishing a dashboard for cities in India, which were very interesting. Next, we uh, had a project where a couple surveys were done in Texas um, about immunization beliefs and some education uh, was presented to students after the first survey and a second survey that came along and measured how what the what the uh, results of this education effort were. Then finally, we did a rapid assessment of behavioral changes, coping strategies and evolving needs during COVID-19. More on these later means that in our projects that we're about to hear about, um, we, will, we will get into two of these projects as, as the slide indicates. So Matt, could we move on to the next slide, please? We're happy to say that we involved more of our volunteers on projects last year than ever before. For our 32 projects, we list down here uh, what each project has in terms of volunteers. And on average, uh, these totaled eight volunteers per project, which says that we estimate that we um, involved 256 volunteers last year, and that's quite an improvement over years previous. Um, we expect to expand these numbers by developing more opportunities like shadowing for junior members, and this will help getting people involved in, in SWB. Uh, the 256 number, of course, doesn't even count our permanent volunteers, which you saw some of those enumerated earlier. Uh, for each of our committees, including marketing and communication and operations. So next slide, please. So next we're going to um, tell you about some projects that SWB volunteers did last year. We're going to go into three projects in some detail to get you um, a bigger picture than the overview that we've presented so far. The first uh, project that's going to be presented is, we'll have uh, Christine Wells being the presenter. Um, Matt, next, there, thank you. All righty. So uh, I'm Christine, and I was the um, statistical uh, consultant on this uh, project. We had six volunteers who actually did the work, but I was there to help and guide. And UNICEF came to SWB and said that they had developed this community rapid assessment, which is basically a survey of anywhere between 19 and 30 questions that were used to measure kind of protective practices, health seeking behaviors, coping strategies, merging needs of individuals in relation to COVID-19 in various countries, mostly on the African continent. And they came to us with uh, data from uh, Kenya, Madagascar and Ethiopia for this particular project. And what had happened was that after they had developed this questionnaire, they contracted with a cell phone provider to contact people in these different countries via cell phone and ask them to participate. And so only those over age 18 were allowed to participate. They collected their data and then SWB got, excuse me, a UNICEF got additional data from each of these countries to help create some sampling weights because we knew from the beginning we had a non-random sample so we had to account for that and so we got some additional information and were able to create sampling weights that we then post stratified by some other um, variables but once we had that we had a complete data set 
Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so we got the data and UNICEF gave us their uh, most important research questions, which were uh, the important differences related to protective behaviors between some of the demographic groups and what role did trust play in general and trust in healthcare workers in particular for these kinds of protective behaviors that they were looking at. And that included things like wearing masks, washing your hands frequently, social distancing, and uh, some other, other things that were specific to each of the countries. So we had um, two volunteers working on each of the data sets. We had three data sets, two volunteers uh, per data set. And the volunteers got to choose whatever software that they were most comfortable with to analyze the data and try to answer these questions. Next slide, please. Thank you. And so, uh, most of the people used R, but we did have SAS users, SPSS users. It's all fine. Whatever, whatever you're comfortable using, that's what you would use as a volunteer. And what we found here was that the adoption of the protective behaviors varied a lot by region in all three countries. So what was happening in each of the countries was really not uniform. It was very specific to the region. And this was really helpful to the local governments. And that was the whole point was to provide data to the local governments so that they could customize their messages and their resources to the needs of the different areas in their country. And so the idea behind this rapid assessment was to have something where we could put it out in the field, get the data to them super quick so that they could respond, not in real time, but, but close to real time. Of course, there were uh, big differences between rural and urban settings. That was kind of an expected finding. Uh, gender was associated with the adoption of a lot of the different protective um, behaviors, but it wasn't really consistent. And that was another important finding to help the various uh, local governments target their messages and try to uh, create some positive change. And the confidence or the lack thereof in many cases in the ability to provide for family needs was very strongly associated with the increase or decrease of these uh, productive behaviors for all three countries. And that was uh, probably the most consistent trend that we saw between the countries. But again, the idea was that UNICEF wanted something where they could get a questionnaire out to people rapidly get results back rapidly and get information that's useful to the governments to uh, help those governments serve the needs of their people. And that's uh, the way we participated in this. It was a fairly quick turnaround, but I have to say we had a lot of fun doing the project. We met with UNICEF on a pretty regular basis. And the write-up of this project is one of the four articles that Matt uh, mentioned with respect to the uh, next uh, issue of Chance that comes out in September. So if you're interested in finding out more about this project, there is um, a more complete write-up in uh, the upcoming issue of Chance. And that's all that I have. On to the next project. Okay, I think it's me. Um, this is Jay, I'm back again. So I worked on a project um, for the Center for Genomic Interpretation. And this was a project that we got um, asking for help with building a confidence interval for the positive predictive value of genetic tests for hereditary cancers. And um, this has to do with the way that uh, genetic testing is used in uh, our healthcare system. Um, so can we go to the next slide? So variant classification or genetic variant classification is a bit more complicated than it sounds like. Um, specifically, the way that you test and identify genetic variant classifications has two um, distinct steps to it. Um, so there is the, what we call the analytical portion, and this is the actual physical test where it's run in the lab 
and any genetic variants in the gene of interest are identified. And there's a set of sensitivity and specificity for true and false positives and negatives. And so we call this analytical sensitivity and analytical specificity. Just identifying a genetic variant isn't enough to say if there's an issue with that genetic variant. Uh, human beings have genetic variation all over the place. Um, so then there is the classification step where once genetic variants are identified using the tests in the laboratory, um, a decision has to be made whether that variant is pathogenic, so likely to be causing disease, or benign, in which case is just a variant that isn't doing anything. And this step also has sensitivity and specificity and true and false negatives and positives associated with it. And this has uh, classification sensitivity and specificity. So there's two very distinct steps to genetic variant classification. Uh, can we go to the next slide? So because we have these two different steps and we have these two different sets of sensitivity and specificity, the classic setup for sensitivity, specificity, PPV, NPV, this classic two by two table isn't appropriate for this situation. So CGI was interested in developing a better model for an all over PPV score for um, genetic tests for hereditary cancers because um, right now the way that people approach this is just assuming that there's very, very few mistakes and therefore if you get a result of a pathogenic variant, that answer is correct at the end. And then they counsel um, their patients based on the assumption that there's no mistakes coming out of these tests. Can we go to the next page? Oh, slide, yes. So just a very quick slide with some technical details. So there's different ways of, of developing formulas for, for true positives, false positives, et cetera, and therefore PPV and NPV in these types of situations. CGI have developed a PPV formula um, before they came to us. And this involves seven input variables, um, four of which are the analytical and classification sensitivity and specificity. What they asked us to do is to develop a confidence interval formula around the PPV. They didn't want to return just the value for PPV. They also wanted like a nice 95% confidence interval. Um, so we sat down to develop um, a confidence interval based on this formula that you see towards the bottom. Um, one useful piece of information to know is that PPV follows a beta distribution. Um, so we had that going for us uh, at the beginning of this slide of this uh, project. Can we go to the next slide? So what we came up with um, has a couple of steps, which I've sort of skimmed here. Um, but the idea behind all of this is that we have our seven input variables that I, I sort of was very vague about on the previous slide. Um, we can use the known distribution for these variables to compute partial derivatives. And we can use a lot of information about um, these seven input variables. And what we can do is we can use that information in a Taylor expansion for the variance of PPV. We can get ourselves a first order approximation. Um, and then once we have uh, this estimate for the variance in the center for the PPV distribution, we know it follows a beta distribution. So we can take all that information from the previous steps. We can generate an inverse CDF for this beta distribution of PPV and then use it to generate the 95% confidence interval. Um, can we go to the next slide? So just a, this is a quick example for BRCA1. Uh, BRCA1 and 2 are uh, two well-known genes that control for breast cancer. This is a very, very common uh, test that people look for. So um, I just want to point out very quickly, if you take a look at the analytical sensitivity and specificity, you'll see that these numbers are like ludicrously high. These are real. Um, the tests are have very, very high sensitivity and specificity and work very well, but there are still errors that happen. So with this example, um, the PPV estimate is about 85%, which is basically saying that of the patients who got a result with a saying that they had a pathogenic variant, we expect about 85% of them to actually have a pathogenic variant and 15% of them 
to not have it for whatever reason. Either they don't have a variant or that variant was incorrectly classified and is actually benign. But if we take a quick look at the 95% confidence interval, it basically runs from 75% to 92%. So best case scenario is actually only 8% of the people have an incorrect result. But the worst case scenario is that up to a quarter of the patients who get a result saying that they have a pathogenic variant actually don't. Um, which sounds extreme. However, this calculator is much better than the current practice of just assuming that there's very few errors in genetic testing. So CGI um, have a plan to make a bunch of different calculators available online for free for doctors and medical professionals to use to get these types of estimates and confidence intervals for the different genetic tests that are used so that they can um, get better results for their patients. So that's the end of the discussion for this project. Thank you, Jay. Uh, so our final project is, uh, we've actually got a video from Sangeeta J uh, Jaya Devan from India. Uh, due to time zone differences, because she is based in India, uh, we wanted to give her the opportunity to do a video recording. So I'm gonna pull that video recording up. Um, as I do that, one thing that I do also want to call out uh, is thank you all for, um, I saw that it, when people were sharing their, uh, their locations, many of you are uh, well beyond the US or Canada or uh, Latin America, Southern America time zones. So those of you in, in Russia and in Ghana and in India and everywhere, uh, thank you in particular for joining. I'm going to go ahead and hit play on this video about a, uh, a COVID dashboard project that we did in India. Hello, happy to talk about the COVID-19 dashboard project. The objective of the dashboard is to provide graphical summaries of COVID-19 incidence metrics to understand the transmission in any given area like a city or even a zone within the city. The idea was to facilitate making of data-driven decisions regarding the implementation of public health and containment measures. The client for this project was the India Excellence Forum, a non-profit based in India. And the target audience was the corporations, um, public policy institutions and citizen forums. Uh, Infectious disease transmission models were used to statistically determine whether the COVID incidence was on a downward or an upward trajectory in any particular city or a zone. The two primary statistics that we used for infectious diseases were effective reproduction rate, RT, and case doubling time. RT measures the rate of change in case incidence over time, and hence RT less than one indicates an effective control or a decrease in new cases over time. So obviously the desired state is for RT to be less than one for a sustained period of time. The dashboard also supported the use of data-driven criteria like levels of test positivity. These metrics are recommended by the WHO to help determine whether an administration could, um, could open up a particular zone or a city. 21-day moving averages were used to smoothen over uh, noise in the data. We periodically had situations where data reconciliation of cases or deaths caused a sudden spike in the data, or, and invariably, there were always data dips during weekends and holidays. This project was implemented in two stages. The first phase developed a proof of concept for just Mumbai city, and the next project extended it to other cities in India. 
in the first phase, we we searched quite a lot and arrived at a model for RT or an epistem. This was developed by researchers from the Imperial College London. Uh, as far as the data sources were concerned, we synthesized different sources of data, both unstructured and structured. In phase two, we also had to port the system to AWS because the current free resources on GitHub and Google Drive were unable to support the IO that we needed. On a daily basis, the dashboard identifies the top 30 districts in terms of cases, in terms of active case load, and computes the current RT for these top 30 cities. Trajectories of case incidents as well as trajectories of plot T are possible. It is possible that we can, the user can compare uh, these trajectories across districts. This view shows the RT and other case transmission metrics at uh, zone level. In, in Mumbai, it is called a board. This kind of views permits decision making at the lowest level. For example, it helps identify zones where containment is still necessary. So there could be some zones within a city where things are fine and certain zones where control containment was still needed. The dashboard was actually an idea for an internal project, which happily was of interest to IEF, the client for this project. The scope actually evolved during the course of the project based on better understanding of the pandemic and based on global best practices. The data for a board was published on a daily basis on on a PDF file. We have to scrape the data of the PDF file to feed into the pipeline. We encountered many surprises along the way as the file format, page numbers, and alignment kept changing, causing job failures. So definitely uh, learning there in anticipating such changes. A big thank you to our SWV volunteers who really worked and made this happen. It's a great testimony to the capability and talent of our volunteers. Thank you. All right. So, uh, and if Sangeeta gets to see the recording, thank you, Sangeeta, for putting that together, for helping to lead that project and, and sharing it, uh, sharing it with us. Now, what I'd like to do is I, those are the three projects that we wanted to discuss. Now, what I'd like to do is I would like it, I would like to uh, toss it to Davina Durgana to take us from here. Oh, sorry. Sorry, my, my microphone is muted. Can anyone see me or am I, is my internet not working? I think my internet's not working. Yeah. yeah, we can see you. Oh, you can. Okay, I can't see me, but let's just make sure this works. Okay, great. So Statistics Without Borders is a pro bono organization, of course, that we, you can see that we do a lot of um, consulting for NGOs and try to help them to optimize the data they have and to use data analytics and data science to their best 
at Rest is Manage. I know Matt talked a little bit about a lot of the things that we've been doing in some of these key projects since um, our last JSM meeting, but what's been really exciting is that our membership has really become much more engaged. Our project um, identification process has become really effective. We're, we're very optimistic that we're going to continue these trends into the next year and be able to see a lot more benefit coming to the NGO and international development community from the amazing things that our volunteers like you all bring to this. Um, we'll definitely talk about some of the other projects that SWB volunteers did, and we're going to talk about um, now as we're moving forward, plans for our next year. Okay, Matt, next slide. So in some very exciting news, we have a few changes into our exec board. So we have an announcement for Matt Brems, who is our anticipated vice chair. We have um, Markham uh, director, who is another announcement. That's Sloka Yinger. And I will also be stepping into the chair position as our current chair, um, Jean, will now be past chair. So our executive committee is coming in strong and we're very excited for um, what the next term will bring. Next slide, please. So for the next um, year, what we're really looking is to increase our communication with you. We want to make sure that our opportunities, uh, what we're doing, and the ways that you can be involved are just very accessible and that there's something that you can do to brag about Statistics Without Borders to all of your colleagues and networks. Um, we've had, as Matt has said, we've had a great time with this special edition, and we're definitely looking to continue um, supporting more publications and presentations, which also means that each of our volunteers will have an opportunity to represent SWB publicly. We're looking to develop additional partnerships. Um, we think that this is going to maximize all of our ability to um, find the right fits for NGOs and data science, and, and so we can really find our niche and help other organizations do the same. And we'll continue to find ways to include our volunteers in more of our activities. We're very excited about our engaged volunteer base and we're looking forward to working more with you. Uh, next slide, please, Ben. Oh, great. Um, back to you, master of the show. <laughs> so um, how to get involved with SWV? Um, there are several ways that you can get involved. And since I work on the ops team, I'll talk a little bit about vacancies that we have. Um, we have current openings for database management, email management, and document management. <clears throat> All of these positions um, do not require really any statistical knowledge. So these are great for people who are just getting started, um, looking to make some connections, looking to get some experience. We really would like for people who have any sort of Microsoft Office um, experience to let us know if you're interested. Um, our email management system is moving over to Tendency from Wild Apricot, so you don't have to have experience with those. We are all going to be learning those together. Um, we will be sending out a form that you can fill out if you are, have any interest on helping us out with these openings. Future openings, um, you can look out at your email for calls for volunteers. We send those out whenever not only uh, position openings come open, but also whenever new projects are looking for support. So just keep looking at your email. Um, in order to get those emails, however, you have to make sure that you are a registered member. So in order to register, you can visit statisticswithoutborders.org and fill out an application. And then you will be able to get those announcing uh, emails and be able to support us with our work. Next slide, please. All right, thank you, Shannon. Uh, and thank you everybody who has presented. So we're about to wrap up the, the presentation part of this. As you've got questions, please put any questions that you have in the Q&A box. Uh, we've got plenty of time for us to be able to answer your questions. Uh, but just a, a couple of last minute things that we want to ask of you while you're here. First is, do you know of a nonprofit or a non-governmental organization or some other type of organization that could benefit from free data or consulting work? 
If so, as the arrow suggests, direct them to statisticswithoutborders.org. Uh, please send them our way. We love to find new projects. We've got a whole new client acquisition team headed by Kathy Furlong and Gary Shapiro. And with that, we want to be able to help send more projects their way. So please feel free to make those introductions and, and direct them to us because we'd love to be able to utilize more of our volunteers and we'd love to double or triple the number of projects that we're able to do in a year. Uh, as Shannon just said, and uh, answering some of the questions that many of you had asked about earlier in the Q&A, if you have specific skills, statistical or data science or otherwise, and you want to volunteer on projects around the globe, also head to our site, fill out that volunteer application if you haven't already done so. If you have and you get those call for volunteers, please respond to those calls for volunteers. What we want to be able to do is figure out ways to get more and more people involved with projects so that it's a, as enriching an experience as possible for you and we're able to deliver the best possible uh, endings to our, uh, to the best possible projects to all of the clients that we've been working with. And then finally, if you just want to hear more about the projects that we are doing, um, please head to our website and follow us on social media. We have just brought on someone who will be focusing almost entirely on social media. We've brought someone on who will be working on developing case studies and things like that to better show off the work that we do. And so if you just want to hear more about the types of projects that we work on and all of that, you can again, head to our website, you can check out our YouTube channel, you can follow us on Twitter and uh, and join our LinkedIn group and, and all of that. But there's a lot of different ways that, that you are able to get involved. And so we'd love for you to recommend us. We'd love for you to volunteer with us. And we'd love for you to follow us on social media. With all of that said, that is the end of our formal presentation. Um, we do want to open up the floor for questions and answers. So all of the people that um, I believe all of the people who have presented today are still on. So you have specific questions about projects, you can ask that. If you want to ask questions about Statistics Without Borders as a whole, please do that as well. Um, so we are, we're around and we're happy to, uh, we're happy to respond to you. Um, a couple of things to call out. So I noticed that Dwart has just responded uh, or asked a question, to which email should we send the suggestions? The email that's currently on the screen here, statisticswithoutborders at gmail.com would be a wonderful place for you to, uh, a wonderful place for you to introduce us to potential clients. Or you can have them go directly, if there's a specific project in mind, have them go to statisticswithoutborders.org. And if they go to that website, one of the things that um, there is at the bottom of the front page, there's the volunteer application and there's a new client form. So a client would, or a prospective client could fill out a form describing the project. And then our new client acquisition team would reach out to them directly to talk more about the project and what it is we can do. So you can connect us via email at the email on the top right hand part of the screen, or you can direct them to the website in the top left part of the screen. And there's that form at the bottom of that page. One other thing that while we're potentially waiting for additional questions to come in, um, I want to, uh, as a, I would say an eagle-eyed individual, but more of an eagle-eared individual or an animal that hears particularly well, um, shared something that I wanted to clear up really quickly. And thank you to the person who, who mentioned this. I mentioned the Chance Magazine uh, guest editing that we did, publishing that in September. Uh, I want to be explicit that that's September 2021. So, the, uh, so Sangeeta's project that she presented that will be included in Chance Magazine in the upcoming September 2021 issue, uh, as well as Christine's project, that the UNICEF project that she talked about, and two other SWB projects, and lots of other projects that people have done through other organizations, including DataKind, including LISA, um, there's, uh, including the Royal Statistical Society. So there's a lot of things that you can see in that edition. So with that, please uh, feel free to share any additional questions that you have with us. We're keeping an eye on the chat and we're keeping an eye on the Q&A. Um, so we're, we'll stick around and answer questions that you've got. That said, as we wait for additional questions or if people don't have questions, uh, please feel free to, to sign off. But thank you so much for joining us today and uh, hearing about some of the projects that we've done and, uh, and some of the work that we're doing. Uh, so we've got a question from Julia Reed. Julia, and this is a question for you, Jay. So Jay, if you want to come on and answer it, I'll read the question out loud for everyone. Uh, Jay, will the volunteer management system that you just mentioned 
keep tracks of the project each person has worked on. And this might be a good way for us to under to better understand uh, how many projects people work on and, and better yet help us ensure that everyone gets a chance to participate in projects. Um, so Jay, would you like to come on and answer Julia's question? Uh, no, I was not told that I have to participate and answer questions. So. <laughs> Uh, no, seriously, I actually hadn't thought about that. That's an interesting question. Um, that actually sounds like something I should talk about with ops. We do, everybody has a, um, a volunteer profile. So to me, this sounds like um, something that we should link to the volunteer profile. So you, the user, for everybody who doesn't know, um, when you sign up for SWB, you get a profile. We have this very long form that we have you fill out and we collect a bunch of information but you have access to your own profile um so i think that we could implement something like this um and we'd probably want to tie it into your user profile so that you could go to your own pro profile and look at it and see which projects you had participated in and then we would have a you know it's a back-end database so we could go into the database and um take a look and see who's done what um I think that's a great suggestion. If anybody, if you guys have other ideas um, for volunteer management stuff, please send them to the email. They'll get sent to me. I'd love to hear if you guys have any requests or suggestions. Um, we are still at the point where we can implement new things. So thanks for, thanks for that suggestion. I will keep that in mind. Yeah, thank you, Jay. Uh, thank you for coming off the bench, even though we did not tell you in advance that you would be responsible for questions. Uh, and thank you, Julia, for the, for the question. Um, so Art Kendall asks, will that edition of Chance Magazine be available for free the way the edition on human rights was made available? That is a good question. And I'm honestly not certain about that. Um, I will reach out to the executive editor of Chance and see if we do plan to make that available for free, um, at least the, the online only version. Um, I'm not 100% on that, so don't wanna commit to it, but I will, uh, I will reach out to Amanda uh, and I will uh, do my best to get you an answer. Um, David has asked, and hello, David, uh, assuming this is the same David Chen, it's good to see your name again. Um, has there been any discussion about internal projects like created by Statistics Without Borders with no external clients to get more volunteers involved? Uh, we have had discussions around that as an executive committee. There are a couple of things that we're interested in exploring and a couple of things that we want to be cautious about um, when it comes to these individual projects or these internal projects that we're doing. By and large, there are things where we are building up our team to have permanent volunteers. So for example, not to, not to bias this totally toward the, the experience that I have with an SWB, but over the last year, we've recruited more marketing and communications volunteers because we recognize there's a ton of work that we wanna be able to do in terms of a quarterly newsletter, publishing case studies, better managing our social media, things like that. And so while those might not be considered projects in the same way we describe projects, like for UNICEF or some other organization, um, we still would consider those to be work that we need to do. So right now where we are in terms of doing individual specific projects is when we've got things like that, whether it's volunteer management, operations, marketing and communications, we tend to recruit people for specific roles for that as opposed to a short-term thing. That's not to say that we've entirely closed the door on focusing on those internal projects, um, but by and large, most of the work that we do is not in that kind of bite-sized project piece that we can do. However, I will say that one example, actually Julia had asked a question earlier, Julia led a project, if I'm remembering correctly, that was an internal focus project on developing graphics, visualizing a lot of the work that we had done in the past. So we have done that and I think we'd like to see that continue. Um, so a long-winded answer that I'll, I'll try and wrap up in terms of, yes, we've had discussions about it. We are primarily focusing on the work that we have and recruiting volunteers for that work, even if it's not in a specific project way. We have done internal focus projects in the past and will likely do that in the future, but I think that's a lower priority than addressing the other work that we have on our plate right now. Um, so I hope that that is helpful. Um, Duarte, are there, uh, are there ideas to expand SWB locally, such as SWB Europe, SWB Asia, etc.? So we, that's a very good question and a very timely question. 
So right now, and I'm, I apologize, I'm going to go back to an earlier slide. So you're going to see me skim this very quickly. I'll put this back up. So we do have a lot of volunteers from all around the world. So while we were created under the American Statistical Association as an outreach group from them, as you can see, we now go far beyond the United States of America in terms of where our volunteers are, as well as the projects that we do um, and the, the organizations that we, that we serve. So with that, are there ideas to expand SWB locally to directly answer your question? The short answer to that is yes. We want to make sure that we can continue finding projects and volunteers in other regions around the world. So one of the things that we are actively working on right now, we have brought on a networking coordinator to do almost precisely what you asked so that we can find ways to get volunteers who are in South America, volunteers in Europe and in Africa, volunteers in various parts of Asia or Australia to be able to connect with one another and use the 1,750 volunteers who we have uh, in a way that is um, in a way where we can um, we can get more people involved, we can develop networking opportunities and things to, to do that. I don't know that in the future of SWB, we would ever have something where there would be specific projects, like let's say that there's a project in South America, and we would want that to be done by SWB volunteers in South America for organizations in South America and limit it in that way. But in some cases, time zones may make that, may make that necessary. For example, um, Sangeeta is running a project in India right now, and it's uh, quite difficult for volunteers in the US to be as involved with that thinking or in Canada or in Mexico, thinking about the, the time zone differences there. So long-winded answer of saying, we want to continue growing our volunteer footprint and our client footprint. And we want to develop events that focus on getting volunteers in certain areas to be able to better work together um, and communicate with one another and things like that. Um, so that is something that we are working on. Um, let's see there. Um, yeah, so yeah, uh, Kathy has asked how many attendees are present for the meeting. Oh, and John, you've already answered that. Thank you. Yeah, we had as high as about 120 attendees um, who are not panelists at the, at the apex of the meeting. Um, yeah, great to see you again, David. Um, and then uh, Art shared a, a world clock, uh, a world clock link. Perhaps time zones would be a partial basis for making up teams. So when we come up with teams, that is something that is considered when the project and client manager and the statistical consultant are working to build out those teams and recruit volunteers. That is something that is sometimes considered depending on the speed of the project, uh, where the client is located and, um, and things like that. So that's certainly something that is is considered to an extent, but we also want to make sure that we're as inclusive as possible. Given that a lot of the volunteers are based in the US, we certainly don't wanna create an environment in which we just provide preference to everybody who's in the US or in Canada because they happen to be closer time zone wise. I think I see Jay so, coming on as well. I was just about to jump in. Um, this is somewhat related. That little throwaway comment I made about how networking and mentoring are not really part of SWB's um, scope, but we have it in, in our list of volunteer management stuff. One of the things that we have been discussing is putting together maybe bi-monthly, every couple of months or, or every quarter or something, um, talks or, or SWB get-togethers in different time zones, because one of the sets of feedback we've gotten from volunteers is that through SWB, they've been running into and meeting up on different projects with other statisticians who are more local to them, um, who they didn't know about before. So if we take a look at this map for, I like to use Africa as an example, um, because I'm proud that I'm an American who knows it's a continent and not a country, but I'm saying, right, that's a joke. Um, but I like to use Africa as an example, because aside from the fact that it's a very, very large continent, you can see the distribution of statisticians or SWB members, um, it's all over the continent, but there's some distinct clumps. So we've had several um, people find out that there are statisticians who are fairly close to them through SWB. So one of the things that we've been discussing is putting together some kind of groups for people in different areas of the country, uh, I mean, of the world, especially people, for example, like in India or Australia, 
um, whose time zones don't match up very well to US time zones where we have a tendency to have our, our talks and our meetings um, and, and informally get some more networking as well for people who are in those various different time zones and regions of the world. Thank you, Jay. So it looks like we don't have any other questions that are currently open with the exception of, again, Art, your question about uh, the, the potentially free edition of Chance. And I will be sure to follow up with you on that. Um, it, uh, yeah, so Rukaya has asked, thank you for the webinar. Do the projects need only experienced volunteers or beginners welcome to apply, knowing that there will be some learning on the job involved? And Kathy is very correct in sharing that projects do not only need experienced volunteers. That will vary based on the project, the number of volunteers who are brought on. But one of the things that is top of mind for us as an executive committee is making sure that we find additional ways to, uh, to bring a diverse group of people on in, in many different aspects, one of which is in terms of that, that experience level. Um, we're grateful that many individuals come with 10, 20, 30 years of experience and they wanna donate that expertise, which is, we're very, very lucky to have that. And at the same time, we also don't wanna limit our project teams to only those who happen to have uh, a really strong background in or a decade or more of experience in a certain area. Um, so we do our best to have different opportunities for individuals of, of different skill levels. One thing that I do want to call out. So I mentioned earlier that we're developing a few videos that we're posting on our YouTube channel and our site. There are many different ways of getting involved. So for example, in the, uh, and if I can go back a few slides here, for marketing and communications, there's a lot of different opportunities where we just brought people on to work in marketing and communications where we may not be, uh, this is not, you, you don't necessarily need 20 years of experience or even five years of experience as a statistician or a data scientist to do that. As Shannon shared earlier in terms of operations, in, if you want to assist us, this might be better for people who have less statistical background. Again, you don't need 20 years of experience to do this, uh, to join the operations team. And even if I go back one more slide and look at the new client acquisition, or sorry, the engagement team, we've got four different sets of individuals here, the new client acquisition team, project and client management, statistical consultants, and the delivery and quality assurance. And in each of these teams, the statistical consultants often do require significant experience. So often you might need a PhD and 10 to 20 years of statistical consulting experience, or sorry, five years of statistical consulting experience, 10 to 20 years of statistical experience, if you want to be on the statistical consultants team. That varies a little bit, especially if you come from more of a data science background where there's fewer PhDs in data science and things like that. Um, but the statistical consultants here really are the ones where that deep statistical knowledge is required. Whereas new client acquisition, project and client management, and delivery and quality assurance, these are teams where uh, it's a lot easier for people who are newer in their careers or new to statistics and data science as a career um, to get involved. So that is a long-winded way of saying there's a lot of opportunities for people of all skill levels to get involved with Statistics Without Borders. Matt, can I jump in, please? Yeah, please, Christine. So um, I'm one of the uh, statistical consultants. Uh, my picture's up there. And I don't want the kind of people who are newer to statistics to kind of shy away from volunteering for projects. Now, obviously there's an upper limit to how many um, volunteers we can take on a project, but we do need a variety of uh, folks with a variety of different experiences and different levels of experiences. So, you know, if you just got say your bachelor's in statistics, don't shy away from volunteering for a project. You know, you're not going to get on every project that you volunteer for because we've got a lot of people applying for a lot of the projects. But we're always happy to take on people who have different levels of experience. Uh, like I said, different software. You know, it, that's fine if you know somebody's using R and someone's using Stata and someone else is using whatever else. You know, we we can guide you through that and. We just want uh, everybody to feel welcome and like, hey, you've got something to contribute to this. 
we're really happy to have you. I think the far more important thing is making sure that your schedule will allow you to work on the project during the time frame the project um, has to run. So even if it's a really great project, if you're super busy, maybe you wait for the next really great project because there will be another really great project coming up usually pretty soon. Um, but we're happy to take uh, volunteers with all sorts of backgrounds. Um, just just sign up and, uh, you know, we're, we're happy to work with you, happy to help you. You know, maybe you know 90% of what you need to know and you're kind of sketchy on the other 10%. That's my role. That's my job to step in and say, hey, let me help you with this. Let me explain this to you. Uh, let me help you with the software. And you gain some experience, something great you can put on your resume. A number of people who worked on the UNICEF project put that on their resume and said it really helped. And we're happy to help you in that respect as well. Yeah, thank you, Christine. Yeah. Are there, uh, let's see, Nancy just asked, and actually, Christine, if I could ask you to answer this one as well, it looks like Nancy has asked a question, can you join a project as an observer when you don't have enough experience? Uh, I would say yes. You're certainly welcome to, um, like for the UNICEF one, there, was, there were a lot of, of meetings, so hopefully you could attend the meetings. But we're certainly welcome to uh, have observers and happy to explain to you what we're doing, why we're doing it, what the considerations are. You know, uh, sometimes it's hard to know all the different moving parts of a statistical project. And it's a great way to kind of take it all in at once without the pressure of having to produce something deliverable to the client. So if you just want to observe and you know, maybe you try to run the statistics yourself, and that's not what we turn into the client. But you want to give it, give it a try on yourself. Hey, that that's just fabulous, and we're we're here to help you do that and to learn. Thank you. Are there? So I know that we've got about two minutes left. So a lot of people have already signed off. If you need to sign off, that is totally okay. Um, it looks like there are no additional questions here. So if you've got a question, get it in under the wire. Um, you've got a minute as I scroll back down to our closing slide here. Um, but again, if, if there's anything that you can think of where you wanna be able to help, if you know of a nonprofit that could benefit from some free work, have some skills and you wanna volunteer, or want to hear about the impactful projects we do on social media, check out our website. There's a lot of information on there. We're continually updating it with the projects and everything that we do. And I just want to wrap up and say thank you all so much for your time. Thank you to the presenters and everyone for, for taking the time today. Um, I want to, in particular, call out Sangeeta. I saw your note in the chat. So I know that it is very late for you as well as everyone else who is based in India and, and related geographies. Um, but thank you so much for joining um, all of the, the panelists, uh, the people who talked about projects, Jay and Christine. Uh, it, was, it was wonderful to be able to hear that. And we're really excited to um, continue to get to work with you. And hopefully we will be able to see you next year. Um, one question that did get in under the wire, who do we contact for interested in the database management volunteering position? John, if you want to shoot an email to statisticswithoutborders at gmail.com and let them know of your interest, that's probably the best way. I do ask that before that, make sure that you've created a, um, a volunteer profile if you haven't already done so. So head to our website, statisticswithoutborders.org, head to the bottom of the page, and there's a, a volunteer form that you can fill out. Once you've done that, then you can go ahead and shoot uh, our team an email at the address here. And thank you, Matt, for uh, running the show. But yeah, we've, we're, we're closing, closing down now until next year. And thanks everybody for attending. Thank you, everyone. Take care. We'll get the recording on YouTube shortly and uh, stay safe. And for those of you uh, attending JSM, enjoy the week. Thanks, everyone.